Okay, next up we have got our first panel of the day uh, entitled Setting the Agenda for Israel and the World. I'd like to invite our panelists up on stage uh, first. Your moderator for this panel will be Anne Corin, who is the co-director of the Institute for the Analysis of Global Security. Uh, I will be sat over here with uh, Ethan as well. We're happy to take questions from the audience, from anyone watching via LiveGo. Uh, please send them to Q&A at Bloomberg.net or Q&A Go, or you can tweet us the questions B with the at uh, BBG Live, or uh, sorry, BBG Fuels or BBG Link are those two handles. Uh, but for now, I'll hand it over to Anne, who is going to uh, introduce the panelists for the next session. Thank you. Well, thank you. Let's get started. We have a wonderful panel here, Mario Granero, Chairman of Brazil Invest, and really the father of the, the godfather, as you say, you. of the ethanol program in Brazil, Professor Eugene Candle, who directs the National Economic Council here in Israel, Bud McFarlane, who was National Security Advisor under President Reagan, and who is co-founder of the United States Energy Security Council. Governor Bill Richardson, not only were you Governor of New Mexico, you were also Secretary of Energy of the United States and Ambassador to the United Nations. With that, let's get started. Governor, it's been 40 years since the Arab oil embargo in 1973. October was exactly 40 years. When we look at the numbers, we see that the countries that sit on the bulk of the world's conventional oil reserves, that's OPEC countries, they sit on some three quarters of the world's conventional oil reserves, produce exactly the same amount of oil today as they did 40 years ago. 30 million of bar barrels of oil a day into the oil market. That hasn't changed. Oil prices are very, very high because of the growth in demand. What are we doing about it? Well, I think what uh, is evident from this uh, conference, and, and, and I want to thank uh, Bloomberg and I want to thank the Prime Minister's Office Fuel Choices, is that the energy markets are dramatically changing. They're changing because of technology, of new laws of supply and demand, and I must say because of uh, the world's largest producer and consumer, which is the United States. Uh, OPEC's uh, influence, I believe, in the longer term will diminish because of the shale gas revolution, because right now the United States is the largest oil and gas producer in the world, overtaking Saudi Arabia, will be soon, and Russia, because you are seeing uh, dramatic new changes in fuel choices and transportation, not just natural gas, liquid to fuels, uh, hydrogen, you're seeing new choices, new markets, and most importantly, I think geopolitically, with the shale gas revolution, you're seeing new options, new options for countries in Eastern Europe uh, in the stands that have been dependent on Russia for natural gas. Uh, in Asia, uh, South Korea, uh, Japan. Uh, as I said, in the Middle East, uh, the, the diminishing power of OPEC, I think you will see. And then most importantly here in Israel, with the new discoveries of natural gas, with uh, sensible energy policies that this government has and what the mayor, mayor outlined, is, is consumers and governments will have more options uh, to confront this new geopolitical landscape. Well, let's start with that natural gas point. Thank you, Governor. Eugene, let's jump over to you. We're here in Israel. Israel is a very small country. Oil demand as compared to the oil demand of the world is very teeny. Why are we here in Israel talking about fuel choice with all of these delegations from around the world focused on the issue? Well, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, in October 2009, Prime Minister Netanyahu issued a challenge to us all and said this is a strategic issue. Many countries deal with it, but in our opinion, Israel, A, has the strongest incentive to actually reduce the world's dependence on oil and transportation because that's like an addiction to, to a drug. And B, just as uh, General Clark just was talking about his fight with the oil companies, we don't have that fight. We actually, we're fighting with oil dollars on other fronts. But, but we, we, we don't have internal opposition. And we do have innovative engine in this country that has solved the problem of water for this country, which we didn't have, uh, solved the problem of food, 
some of it solving the problems of energy. And so we thought that we could be a great catalyst for this. And it's, it's really inspiring to see all the wonderful people that came here. This is a great, a great conference, uh, uh, all the people in the fuel initiative. Uh, it's, it's really satisfying to see this. And I thank you all for, for coming. This is the right place to talk about it. But the implementation has to be elsewhere because we're too small. Well, let me continue asking you about the natural gas in Israel that Governor Richardson mentioned, the offshore fines in Israel. How is, uh, what is the thinking around how that gas can be used to be placed in competition against oil in the transportation sector? Again, the only reason to think about gas in Israeli context is to, is a showcase. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't, we're, we're not, whether we use oil at all or don't use oil, it's not going to move the needle on the oil prices in the world. But we are talking about and, and, and actually doing this year of starting a series of pilots of trying to move transportation, uh, as the mayor Huldai was talking about, in the cities trying to move really revolutionary systems that are of, of mass transport. Uh, Israel is a good place to experiment because we are self-contained, not because we want to, but because that's, that's the way it is. It's small, it has different climates, and it's a relatively limited range. So we believe that Israel, and we talk to and, and, and cooperate with um, uh, car companies, that are interested in working with us on experimenting with their different engines, different fuel types, and uh, we believe that we can actually experiment with many different types. So the whole country essentially can be a big pilot project? Uh, I believe so, and we would very much like to be that. Governor, I see you want to jump yeah, in here. Yeah, I've seen the data on these new uh, gas reserves that Israel has, has uh, discovered, and they're very serious, they're substantial. I think these are great opportunities for Israel. Number one, find some qualified operators to work with Israel to, to do the drilling, and, and hopefully it'll be uh, American companies because of the strategic relationship. But secondly, I think they're great opportunities for uh, energy ties with countries like Turkey, like Jordan. I think a real regional effort that would give uh, Israel a strong doses of energy security. Thank you, Governor. I agree. But tell me, what is wrong with a single fuel transportation system? Why do we even need to think about fuel choice? Well, the problem with relying on any single item is that it could become unaffordable or it could become disrupted by violence or capricious activities, such as by a cartel. So it's clear that in a globalized world where Israel, the US, India, China, all countries are becoming ever more connected for their economic growth or even survival. And so for all of them to face the risk that that single fuel, which really powers their entire economy, becoming unaffordable or unavailable is simply not sustainable. It could be catastrophic. And so there's a self-interest by every country in the world in having choice. Just as you have choice on your cereal in the morning or the clothes that you buy, why not expect reasonably choices at the pump? And I think all of us have to agree that having choice is one thing. In addition, there's no reason why we ought to subsidize or favor or pick winners. Let's let the market decide. And whether it's electricity, as is happening in Israel. You mean for electric plug-in hybrid and electric vehicles? That's right. Whatever can power an automobile from electricity to hybrid electrics to biodiesel, ethanol, methanol, someday fuel cells maybe. But the point is, let's get them into the marketplace. And that's why I so admire what Israel is doing here to advance an open research and development and deployment of these alternatives. 
And the focus really has to be on the transportation fuel market and on vehicles because if we look at the U.S., for example, only 1% of U.S. oil demand is due to electricity generation. Only 1% of U.S. electricity is generated from oil. That's why electricity is such a great transportation fuel. This is really all about transportation, right? It's, it's, it's oil's monopoly over transportation fuel that gives it its strategic importance. Mario, you know, Brazil is a fascinating country on, on, on so many levels. And, and one of the most interesting things was in the wake of the Arab oil embargo and later the revolution in Iran, oil prices are going up. Countries around the world, especially the poorer countries, going into severe debt. Brazil makes a decision. We are going to go to sugarcane ethanol. And you were there. Yeah, fortunately, I was there. And the coincidence was that the, the moment was to change. And uh, the changement was abrupt, and uh, I would call perhaps uh, revolutionary in the terms that uh, uh, a production of cars were, at that time we were producing one million cars per year, and we decided in three months to start to leave all the gasoline and go into the ethanol. So this required- well, You were chairman of the Brazilian Automotive Association yes, at the time. Yes, it's true, yeah. at that time. So uh, this required uh, three points that uh, we were talking before. The first, uh, a coordination about the car industry, about the, the alternative energy producers, and uh, the acceptance by the, uh, by the clients, let's say, of the, the new automotive uh, fuel-powered in Brazil. And the force that's a part of that is that is required also the coordination and a mandate with the government. So the, uh, when you have all these four elements together, you could really change something that was really in Brazil an embedded uh, uh, custom for a long time. So now something like 95% of new cars in Brazil are flexible fuel? Yes, yes. But uh, the flexible is quite interesting that, that the flexible today is much more an alternative than uh, really uh, the first choice. The first choice is ethanol. So you, so you mean gasoline is the alternative fuel in Brazil? For sure, but uh, we are, the government sometimes gives a mandate and sometimes distorts the mandate. And uh, I think that it was the case now where the price of gasoline, and we had established a relationship between the price of the gasoline and the ethanol to have the same calorie results per mile, uh, should be not almost 30% in difference. But the question was that the government now, to avoid inflation, put a, a cap on the price of gasoline. So gasoline is being subsidized essentially in Brazil That's by correct. the Petrobras. And not and not and not the ethanol. So makes a, what makes a very strange situation for a country like Brazil. So this is exactly the opposite of what's happening in some other countries. In essence, for sure. Petrobras it's, is losing a lot of money, right? Since the beginning we never asked for the subsidies. I always thought that we could have had this on keeping the price as long as the gasoline and this correlation was kept. So you're saying essentially different fuels have different energy content per gallon or yeah. per liter. A consumer isn't going to buy a fuel unless it's cheaper per mile. You, you, don't look at the, you don't compare, let's say, the cost per gallon. You compare the cost per mile. And if it's cheaper sure. per mile, you compare it on energy yes, content. Yes, but for this reason, we established the 30% gap Yes. between the two. But when you compress the price of gasoline, you do not have the readjustment due to inflation and, and the cost productions on the ethanol. Yes. But you are just subsidizing the, uh, on a very uh, unfortunate basis. And the result is that we have imports on gasoline or use of gasoline. This is double what should have been. Right. So that's the result of that's Petrobras. That's distorted, let's say, giving the mandate and distorting the mandate. Yes. That's the government. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, and, and Governor, I so say you both wanted to jump in here. I think what 
my colleagues are saying is that all of us, and indeed a globalized economy from China to Brazil, have various reasons, but they do include national security, cost or economic incentives, as well as environmental incentives. All of these are being served, or would be, if we would have an open market for fuel, transportation fuel. And indeed, the alternative is just unacceptable that we remain reliant upon a single fuel. We have to have access to affordable energy and let the market decide what that is. Gasoline, maybe. Ethanol, probably. Methanol, we think. Talk about methanol a little bit. Tell us about methanol. Well, methanol is a clean burning, environmentally desirable, low emitting, very high octane fuel. A liquid fuel, right? A liquid fuel that fits within the infrastructure we already have deployed, pumps that can blend whatever, gasoline, ethanol, methanol, or any combination of those and run very well. And methanol is something that race car drivers are using. They love it. It's high octane. Even the automobile makers like it because high octane enables them to make a smaller, more efficient, more powerful engine. So there's nothing not to like. So you can use methanol in a, actually, if I'm not mistaken, the flex fuel vehicles in Brazil run, can run on gasoline, ethanol, and methanol. Even though people yes. think gasoline, ethanol. Yeah. You, because all our alcohol is All alcohol. That, so it and it's one fuel yes. tank. One fuel tank, you choose what you want to put in. But I would like just to point out something that happened with us on the automotive industry. And I was the chairman at that time. Uh, the first idea when we came to that and uh, on the verge of a rationing in Brazil, and I put together all the presidents of it, telling, look, we have to change the model. And uh, two companies were ahead of that. Fiat and Volkswagen had already developed a consistent studies in, uh, in terms of uh, ethanol. But uh, the Americans, General Motors and Ford, and also the, some part of the cars from outside, they were resistant to that. Resistant for one thing that the general told very well. The firstly is that it's a new thing. They had to, to commercialize something that they never commercialized. And uh, secondly, because it was a problem of distribution how could the Brazil is a large country? How we you have an Amazon and they should have at the same moment over there in the south that they stand 8,000 kilometers the same at ethanol. So I think that uh, this was where the automotive industry reacted very quickly. And they accept within uh, 20 days to start the full production and to ethanol. Why? Because the ethanol, Henry Ford made the first Fords that were moved by, by ethanol. So it's not a big, big issue on that. And secondly was the distribution that Petrobras, we found a breakthrough where we could have Petrobras distributing this from one day to the other. Petrobras is a national oil company. Na right? National oil company. And all then follow it. Shall and so on. Yeah, I, I think, and I like ethanol and methanol, but I think we're, we're neglecting to talk about probably the reason for, for this option, and, and I agree with Bud McFarlane of, of, of transportation options, and that's the development of natural gas. Mm -hmm. uh, because what we've had, because you, you only had one fuel, gasoline, that was because of gas scarcity. When natural, natural gas, gas scarcity. right, natural gas scarcity. Now that natural gas is exploding uh, all over the world, principally in the United States, you are seeing these new options. You're seeing uh, natural gas. You're seeing gas to liquids. You're seeing uh, methanol made from natural methanol. gas. Methanol. You, you, you see uh, hydrogen. Electricity generated from Absolutely. natural gas. Absolutely. And then also the 
But I think what's also very important is the new technologies that have come with natural gas. Hydraulic uh, fracturing, uh, mm -hmm. horizontal drilling, which, which have some environmental challenges. But that new technology has revived fossil fuels. Uh, the danger, and, and, and the general mentioned this, is that climate change carbon footprint increases. On the good side, there's a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by natural gas. There's uh, a manufacturing base that can be created. There's, uh, I think, some geopolitical benefits. But most importantly for a consumer, for a country like Israel, what has to happen is, one, a good regulatory environment. Two, the government has to play a role, you know, and I guess I'm going to be accused of being a Democrat here, but I do think uh, government can be a catalyst, can set a regulatory framework. Now in these fiscally constrained times, what, what, is, what, is, what, what are the types of roles that government can play? Well, for instance, in the United States, uh, I'm a strong supporter. I think many, many here are renewable energy, solar, wind, biofuels. I would like to see in the United States a renewable portfolio standard where every state, every one of the 50 states, has at least a 25 percent uh, renewable mandate. But that's that for doesn't electricity. happen. That's for electricity. If we're looking at the transportation fuel market. Well, I think, you know, it, what happens in the United States, a lot of individual states, when I was governor, we had our own standard. But mm -hmm. uh, I think what you, all you want to do is give the consumer and the private sector incentives, options, just stay out of the way, uh, but try to promote that new technology that will make uh, the consumer have more options. So for example, open the cars to fuel competition, yeah. and then the consumer can say, I want to put this fuel in my sure. car now because it's cheaper, and next week I'll put something else. That's right. I, I think that's what, that's what a, a government can do. And can we just remind the audience if they have any questions? Uh, that they want to uh, ask our panelists or, or yourself, uh, Q&A at Bloomberg.net, or if you're a Bloomberg professional user, just do Q&A Go. Sorry to interject, but we like to get audiences to participate, so back to you there. Now, what I am hearing the governor say when he's talking about natural gas and the, the shale gas revolution in the States, it seems to me that if we look at the global oil market, because this is a market dominated by a cartel, while it's wonderful for the United States that there's more oil being produced, more tide oil from shale formations, at the end of the day, even as imports in the US have fallen from 60% to less than 40, oil price has gone up. So, so the, the oil production, let's say, isn't going to influence the global market so much because the developing world is sucking up that excess, that surplus on the market, and OPEC isn't increasing supply. But what I'm hearing you say, is that the natural gas production, along with other energy sources, that has the poten potential being the real game changer in the oil market. Because if you force oil into commodity arbitrage with natural gas, with biomass, with coal, with other energy sources by opening the car to fuel competition, you are going to drag down the price of oil because competition drags down the price. I think, and, and, and Bud McFarlane, as national security advisor, probably is more of an expert on the national security implications, but the answer is yes. I believe that uh, what shale gas does, one, uh, the development, but also LNG exports, a free trade agreement, United States, Europe, we have uh, free trade agreements. And ad actually, I think we haven't talked about that, free trade agreements in the commodity area is, is very important. But yes, OPEC's role, uh, the oil cartel would, would be diminished, especially in its relationship with the United States and Western countries. I'm not saying it'll disappear. It's still going to be very powerful. Secondly, you build new energy relationships. Uh, I mentioned South Korea, uh, Japan that go away from nuclear and more into LNG. Uh, the stands, uh, countries like the Ukraine, Poland, that are so dependent on Russia uh, would seek new opportunities. Uh, and then also, uh, I think you see opportunities in, in the Middle East, in Africa. Mozambique has new uh, LNG uh, discoveries, natural gas discoveries. And, and I think with, with uh, well, Israel, I think, first has to get these reserves out. But yeah, I think geopolitically, we, we are better off, less dependent on cartels, more dependent on competition. Now, this shale gas boom has to continue. And uh, I think it probably will, 
but there are challenges. You know, in Europe, the, the fracking issue is very strong. Uh, no fracking in several countries. Uh, Britain is moving, I think, towards doing uh, shale gas. But, but I think here's where government can play a role. There should be environmental controls on natural gas, on fracking. There, there should be sensible disclosure of chemicals. Uh, you know, my friends in the natural gas industry would say, oh, leave us alone, we can do it without regulations. Well, no, no, because it affects water, it affects uh, uh, methane, and you've got to be careful how you do it. But you're saying the perfect is the enemy of the good. You know, make sure everybody's using best practices, but don't go so crazy that you're saying no to everything, because if you yeah. say no to everything, you're going to get a very expensive transportation fuel. Right. But let me jump over to you. Inter we start talking now about international cooperation. If we look at the United States, at Brazil, at China, together you're looking, I think, about something like half the vehicle market in the world in terms of uh, vehicle production. What's the potential there? for collaboration? Well, that's a very key point, and having half the automobile production of the entire world buying in Brazil, China, and the United States, if those countries alone were to adopt a flex fuel standard, as Brazil has very sensibly done, and which China is leading the way in Asia already, and enabling alternatives like methanol, which is becoming very popular in China. Because you know, it's cheap. Because it's cheap. And as you've said before. And they're making it from coal, right? They are. And that's what really drives the consumer's judgment, though, when they drive up to the pump. What's cheap today? It's always going to be the driver if you have a choice. And that's the point. We simply cannot have the global economy vulnerable to relying for transportation, which is critical to their growth, one fuel. So we don't have to favor one or the other, whether it's electricity or ethanol or methanol, but simply open the marketplace. And if we don't, we're facing a catastrophic risk of the collapse of the global economy through the price of oil. And that price is driven by a cartel. It could be dramatically increased if demand outstrips supply, if it's disrupted by violence, or if capricious activity by a cartel runs it up arbitrarily. So we've got to get on with this, as Israel is doing right here. You know, Eugene, I heard someone say, a uh, former prime minister of Israel, actually, the Middle East is a bad neighborhood. It's not the Midwest. <laughs> and uh, you're reading? Couldn't agree more. <laughs> I actually lived in the Midwest, and I, I can compare. <laughs> reading, the opening, reading the news every day, New, new catastrophes every single day, and this, this region is obviously very, very volatile. And the bulk of the world, cheap to extract oil reserves are here. And Israel is kind of right in the middle of everything. So you have a unique perspective on what's going on. When we look at the future for stability in the region, are we going to achieve kumbaya, or can we expect volatility that will drive oil prices higher? Well, I don't know. I'm not a prophet, but uh, you know, among all this turbulent uh, sea, I think that there's a small island of, of stability, whether it's financial stability, whether it's democ democracy, whether it's um, political stability. Any, in any direction that you look, there's one, one island of stability which we are sitting in the middle of. So uh, here, I believe that uh, this will continue to be a stable, stable environment. I wanted to add to Mr. McFarlane's um, point that on top of everything else in cartel, et cetera, et cetera, the majority, a high percentage of world oil supply goes through a very, very narrow place, which at least on one side populated by somewhat inconsiderate people. So that could be another point that, that we should be very, very worried about. Um, You're talking about the choke points in the ocean. Exactly, yeah, and so, so just even, even without cartel, this, this could be some, some, some of the rogue uh, state, uh, single rogue state could seriously uh, endanger the world supply of that commodity, and, and for that reason only, you don't want to rely, rely on that. Uh, I believe that uh, what we've been lacking, there is, uh, um, there's an, uh, a slideshow that shows every U.S. president 
saying that we're going to reduce our dependence, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, the dependence is, is, is reduced, but not because of, of, of a policy, but because you know, somebody found a lot, of, a lot of oil. But I think that what has been missing from the, from the policies in many countries, and Brazil is a great example of how to do it right, because they've done it from 1970 through the way prices of oil went down, went up, they unwavered. They didn't waver and they pursued the policy. So this is focus on a policy. It's not necessarily the policy of let's reduce uh, gas emissions. Let's reduce uh, emissions of CO2. Everything, it's all very important. But let's focus on one thing that is a matter of, so of national security. It's a matter of economic survival. It's a matter of, of environment. Let's focus on this very, very narrow target. Let's have more choices. We have more choices and we narrow the target and we commit for a long time. Then we will succeed. The Israeli program on fuel choices is, uh, is a small program. It's about $40 million a year, but it's for 10 years. It's about half percent of what we spend on oil per year as a country. If we can convince everybody to spend half percent of what they spend on oil every year to commit to 10 year program, we will be there in five years. And we've got a question actually from uh, uh, Gina and Yoram. I'm not sure if they're in the audience or, uh, or watching over live go. Uh, I guess this is mainly directed at you, Professor Kendall. Uh, uh, what is more economical for Israel, uh, to use a surplus natural gas as fuel for transportation or to export it as uh, liquefied natural gas? It's actually, it, it, these two questions are independent because if we're talking about methanol, uh, CNG is, is, is one area. CNG is compressed natural yeah, gas. Yeah, CNG is the compressed natural gas is one area where we would like to explore the possibility. But due to some of the security considerations, it may not be such a widespread usage as it is in other countries. But we still can do it in certain limited applications. In all other areas where we uh, we, we can uh, use methanol. It doesn't matter whether the meth methanol comes from Israeli gas or it comes from Trinidadian gas or Egyptian gas or Qatari gas, which are much, 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 more, much cheaper to produce. So these two questions are not, uh, are not necessarily related. And so I think we should pursue the policy of trying to maximize the value of the gas at the same time, we should pursue the policy of trying to incentivize the citizens and the, and the car owners to, to, to move to, to alternative uh, transportation fuel. The very important thing I'm hearing you say here, and this goes to your comment about the United States where we had president after president talking about reducing imports, and it goes to your comment just now about the gas, which it doesn't really matter who makes the methanol from the natural gas no. that you buy? This is not about cutting any country off from the global market. No. This is about, we have a global market now, that the oil market, that's dominated by a cartel. And the cartel has, by constraining its production, has kept prices much higher than they would otherwise be. But if we have a competitive transportation fuel market, because cars are open to fuel competition, mm -hmm. so consumers can make an on-the-fly choice among fuels depending on price, it doesn't matter where that fuel comes from. You know, Brazil sometimes can export ethanol, it can sometimes import. import ethanol. Israel could sometimes export methanol, it could sometimes import. The Absolutely. United States, same for everything. As long as you have a competitive market, we don't care if we're importing bananas or we're importing computers. If you have a competitive market, you can buy from the cheapest place at any given time, right? That's yeah, what it's about. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a, it's a question. It's a question of making the infrastructure. It's actually not just cars but also the refueling system that, you know, all the standards and the supporting policies which we're trying to institute here, those because the, 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 the uh, process of the um, driver filling the car with a choice of fuels, as Brazil discovered, re requires the car being able to accept the fuel, the driver being able to find the fuel. There were at some point 100,000 flex fuel cars in New Jersey and there were two fueling stations. So you have, to, you have to support that, you have to have refineries. So it's a, it's a much more complex puzzle, which therefore requires coordination, and we believe that the coordination can come from only one source, the government, which does not have to own this, but it has to put standards and enable it. 
So acts and, like then, the, and then let the market. Acts like the corner. You have a chicken and egg problem here where the automakers say, you know, a flex fuel vehicle that can run on a variety of alcohols plus gasoline, it costs just $100 more than a regular car. But still, why should we bother to warranty it if there's no fuel at the stations? And the fuel station owner says, well, if I have 10 pumps, why should I bother to retrofit a pump to serve a fuel right. where the cars can't use the fuel? So you're saying the government has to come in and say, for example, auto companies, you are the chicken. <laughs> Except there are several chickens and several eggs. Mm -hmm. We have to coordinate all of them. Mm -hmm. But I saw you wanted to jump in. Well, in the United States, we have 250 million cars and we produce about eight or nine million every year. If you wanted to turn over that entire fleet to be able to use alternative fuels, it would take a long, long time. And that's a very good reason why the government can be helpful here in allowing the retrofit of all 250 million right now. You mean ease regulation so that if you want to retrofit, or a company wants to offer you retrofits, it's not hard to do that. That's right. It may only cost $90 if the manufacturer makes it, and it may cost more, but it still would be nominal cost, maybe $300. Still, you would get that back in very little time because a natural gas fuel, for example, is one-fifth the cost of gasoline. And so you'd get it back very quickly. <laughs> You Governor, know, I see you're itching to jump in. No, uh, and one area we haven't talked about, but we kind of dangle a little bit, and, and you mentioned incentivizing citizens, is what the average citizen can do. And that's what is called energy efficiency initiatives. Uh, we haven't talked about that, but that involves, for instance, the grid being modernized, finding ways that there is an overcapacity, that uh, there's more technological investment in it. It also means buildings and uh, homes and uh, businesses that, uh, that are greener. Uh, you know, this statistic about the United States becoming more, becoming energy self-sufficient by 2025, the International Energy Agency, was both by oil and gas development, particularly natural gas, but also by dramatically increasing energy efficiency that citizens are using. And I think this is something that I know in Israel uh, is, is happening uh, because you have to. You have to be more energy efficient at the home, business, schools, and, and we, haven't, we haven't talked about that. We've talked about cars and cartels, but I think that's a very important component uh, for reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. Thank you. And we have just a minute or so left, I, I'd like to end this on, on one point, which is kind of let, let a, a metric that helps us understand. We talked about national security, we talked about economics, air quality in Sao Paulo. Where is it now as compared to where it was when the, the ethanol program started in Brazil? Very much so. I think that uh, was not only the Berkeley Institute uh, University make a very nice institute, but also in Brazil. We improved the quality of air for around 26%. 26% improvement in air quality. Since the moment we start with the ethanol and then uh, to, uh, to mix that. But today, I think that we could normally tell that there is a, a large uh, reduction on pollution on that. And the egg and the, the, egg and the, and the chicken. You have to kill the chicken at the first moment tell the automotive industry to go this way. But you have to create at the same moment the distribution for the guy there to buy and to have access of that. The automotive industry will not make a suicide, but on the other side, there is a huge opportunity for the people to produce alternative, economy, alternative fuels. Thank you very much. So fuel competition, a competitive fuel market, improves national security, improves the economy, and improves air quality. Thank you very much to our panel.